This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis. Welcome to Kick-Ass News. After spending most of his 20s pursuing a career as a literary agent, John Hodgman decided to try his own hand at writing. Following an appearance to promote one of his books on The Daily Show, he was invited to return as a contributor. This led to an unexpected and implausible career in front of the camera that has lasted to this very day. Now in his latest book, Medallion Status, True Stories from Secret Rooms, Hodgman explores the strangeness of his career, speaking plainly about status, identity, and fame, especially the weird marginal level of fame he enjoyed. And on today's show, John Hodgman talks about the strange sense of validation he gets from his airline loyalty program, the perks and perils of hotel living, and the best way to get thrown into Disneyland jail. He talks about his memorable appearances on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, how Daily Show colleague Al Madrigal got him into stand-up, and his podcast where he mediates minor disputes between squabbling couples. He recalls his early days as a fancy New York literary agent, the worst book manuscript he ever read, and the writer who became his stalker. Plus, we talk about John's remarkable skill at gaining entry into all manner of exclusive and sometimes sinister clubs, from Yale's secret societies and meetings of the New World Order, to the Church of Scientology's Flagland base, and even Mar-a-Lago. Coming up with John Hodgman in just a moment. John Hodgman is a writer, humorist, stand-up comedian, and actor best known for his memorable appearances on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. He is the host of the popular Judge John Hodgman podcast and also contributes to a weekly column under the same name for the New York Times Magazine. He's the author of five books, including The Areas of My Expertise, More Information Than You Require, That Is All, and Vacation Land. Now he's out with his newest, titled Medallion Status, True Stories from Secret Rooms. John Hodgman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I can verify all of those facts are true. Okay, thank you all very that, much. <laughs> that all tracks with my experience. I wrote those books. I did those things. I think the only thing I might quibble with, as I emphasize in Medallion Status, my mm. new book, I'm more of an imitation stand-up comedian. I'm doing my best <laughs> possible version of stand-up comedy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I get up on stage and I tell stories, but I don't really, don't really care whether it's funny or not. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe I shouldn't be calling myself a stand-up comedian, more of a storyteller. Well, I have to tell you, John, I felt very honored to have you on the show until I saw that the last podcast that you did was hosted by an actual high school student. <laughs> Your publicist Which doesn't really that? screen these requests, do they? <laughs> what was what? Are you telling me that Ira Glass is in high school? <laughs> I don't know the podcast that you're referring to, oh, you but don't? I'm sure that it, I'm sure that it is a. A reputable organization. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I, I think it was, it sounded at least that, like it was literally hosted by a high school student because all the questions related to high school. And every time you would start regaling him with some great story, he'd try to steer the conversation back to high school and say, you know, you ever go to any rich kid parties? Who's your favorite teacher? <laughs> it's magical <laughs> in its own way, I have to say. <laughs> I, you know, there, there are two things that this brings to mind. One is that I am getting older and I have zero memory of any of this. <laughs> So maybe 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 I had a stroke or something. I didn't realize it. They're going to check me here in the studio. And and two, the fact is that I like talking to people, and I, I've got a lot of advice for weird, lonely, 13-year-old only children. As I was one myself, <laughs> I can give them a certain amount of guidance. And indeed, in, in this new book, Medallion Status, a whole chapter is dedicated to career advice for children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and God bless you for that. You you were very gracious and magnanimous with him, very generous of you. And I, and I can kind of relate to that because I've only now discovered that there was a whole generation of kids who then later in life went into entertainment. But when they were kids like me, they would call up celebrities and famous old Hollywood stars who had nothing better to do maybe and ask for sure. interviews. And they thought, I know that I did, I would call up like Ginger Rogers and call? people like that. And I thought I was yeah. very smart and they didn't know that I was just a little 15 year old kid. I bet they knew more than you realized. I bet yeah. they loved talking to you. What did you talk to Ginger Rogers about? 
Um, you know, it was a weird thing. She was very cranky. She was in Houston, Texas for a <laughs> film festival. And uh-huh. I, it, I, I maybe she didn't know because I, I mean, I kind of misrepresented. I had like a local uh, newspaper that would kind of give me uh-huh. press status at these things. And then I show up at her hotel as like a 15, 14 year old child in a suit with a tie. I think I got off on the wrong foot to begin with. Oh, you, with got, you spoke to her in person. She obviously knew you were 15. <laughs> you didn't ask her to dance, did you? Uh, I didn't. I didn't. And one thing I learned is she hates talking about Fred Astaire. Sure. I can imagine. So if your whole life has been dominated by that other name. Yeah. That's how I feel. About, that's how I feel about Jonathan Colton. No, that's just my best friend. Never mind. I used to call people, too. Like, I, I am that weird person. Well, I, I uh, in New York, in, when I moved here in the 1990s, they were still publishing and we were still using phone books. And a lot of people had their names in the phone book. Legendarily, right. you could call Henny Youngman, and if he answered, he would tell you some jokes, oh, which was an wow. incredible thing. I didn't know that. And I remember. Now he wasn't I alive when calling. you were a young kid, because I, I would have done that too. I love Henny Youngman. He's no, hilarious. he was a lot. He was alive in the in the nineties when I was in my twenties, because my friend Adam would call him up and say, "Tell me a joke," and he would go, eh, "All right, uh, take my wife, please," or whatever. Oh my God, that's oh, I wish I had known that. Man, that would have been amazing. But then I called um, John Lurie, who is a uh-huh. jazz musician and actor. I was very, I was very, I was a very pretentious young person. I liked the art house <laughs> movies. Yeah. I was really into Down by Law, the Jim Jarmusch movie that John Lurie was in. <laughs> and he was an East Village sort of uh, uh, king. Yeah. And I would call, I would call him and I got his answering machine and I, and I, and I chickened out and I said, so he was like, oh, it was John Lurie, leave a message. I was like, oh, hey, John, it's me. Your friend Sam Potts, give me a call back. Now, Sam Potts was my friend mm. from high school who also <laughs> loved John Lurie. And I, and I was too cool. scared to say anything else. And I left Sam's number. And months later, Sam said, why do you think John Lurie called me? <laughs> and Sam was very confused. Yeah. Yeah. Mine were all just <laughs> obscure, like actors, uh, not nowadays obscure, like Ann Miller. And like, right. at one point I was obsessed with trying to reach Irving Berlin, who had just turned a hundred years old and was a total recluse. So I guess that was my version of J.D. Salinger or something. <laughs> did you succeed in your, in your mission? I did not. No, <laughs> I got a nice letter, but I did not. <laughs> I know Bruce Campbell, the, the, you know, so. Bruce Campbell, of course, the star of Evil Dead and Evil Dead Two, and uh, and then later Burn Notice. I mean, he's a a huge the Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. He's this this huge sort of cult mm-hmm. movie icon. Sure. And and it, you know he was later on after people stopped using the telephone. Uh, not too long after that, we got uh, high speed uh, internet in the office that I worked in right after college. I worked at a literary agency. In fact, right. I, I was going to and and briefly did become a literary agent. And and one of my first clients was Bruce Campbell, <laughs> the the my fa- my favorite horror movie icon. And I reached out to him through the internet. The internet was and still is to some degree this great leveler of being able to mm-hmm. communicate with your heroes and. Bruce had been writing blog posts about what it was like to be a a B movie actor, to be like the most famous person in the ballroom of a horror movie convention. But then once you leave and go out into the lobby, you're just some schmo. You know what I mean? And I thought <laughs> that was an incredible true. thing to write about. And uh, and and w- weirdly, and now I understand because of Bruce's great generosity and sense of adventure, he thought it was fine to let a completely unproven twenty five year old nobody represent a book for him. And he ended up <laughs> writing the book after we sold it finally to St. Martin's Press called um, If Chins Could Kill, Confessions of a B-Movie Actor. <laughs> and Bruce told stories about how when he was a kid, he would call the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but a very famous uh, retirement home for actors in Los Angeles to oh, yeah. talk to Larry Fine of the Three Stooges. Oh, yeah. And he would just get on the yeah. phone with Larry and talk with him for a long time. So yeah, and I, I heard I guess this. he sensed a a kindred spirit in me, yeah. someone who would hound another person. Yeah, I've heard that from like Gilbert Gottfried and a bunch of people who would call Larry Fine. The other one was Stan Laurel, apparently was listed mm-hmm. in the phone book. And there's a whole generation of young boys who are now producers and comedians and all that who tell all of these stories about how they'd talk to them for yeah. a half hour or something. 
Well, sure. And look, here I am talking to you. I have no idea who you are. You could be a <laughs> high school student as far as I know. Apparently, yes. I'll talk to anybody <laughs> just to talk about the old days of the old PC versus Mac campaign and yeah. the Daily Show and all the things I used to do way back there in the silent go. movie era. <laughs> Everything comes full circle. Yeah. It's funny because Medallion Status is my new book about my my world in this sort of like twilight between fame and obscurity mm -hmm. <laughs> on television and in Hollywood after I started working on The Daily Show, I had this profoundly unlikely career on camera. And even the most minor fame admitted me into some very strange secret rooms, both literal to literal and figurative exclusive parties and worlds that I was not privy to before. And then I talk about getting kicked out of those rooms one by one until <laughs> you are where, where I am now. And I'm not even as famous as the least famous Corgi on Instagram. But <laughs> in many ways, I've now written my own version of the Bruce Campbell book that I sold back when I was in my 20s, <laughs> Confessions of a, of a B-movie yeah. minor television personality. Yeah, yeah. I have to ask about, the, I, I want to say you did seven years at a literary agency. What was the worst manuscript yep. that you ever read? Can you remember? Well, I remember it because it was about, I'm going to say, 1,500 printed pages long. It was wow. reams of paper <laughs> and arrived in a, a cardboard banker's box wrapped in duct tape. And that should have been, I mean, it was like lifting a tree stump up the stairs to read it. <laughs> and the the wrap, the, the, the manic wrapping and duct tape should have been the tip off that the person who sent it was not merely a little unstable, but more unstable than most authors. <laughs> and in, indeed, indeed, I, you know, I did my best. I always wanted to, I always wanted to read as much as I could of a book, no matter how strange or obviously not fit for publication it might be, because every time someone sent a manuscript to the literary agency, they were entrusting you with their dreams. And on mm -hmm. some level, I realized it wasn't fair that these people who had sat down and written whole novels on spec just out of the hope that someone would care about them would have their dreams then handed not into an agent's hands, but into the hand of like a 23, 24-year-old receptionist at the agency whose job was to catch the overflow of submissions. And and the first read would happen by me, some unqualified young person. So I always tried to give it my best and to write back something nice. Yeah. And this this manuscript was was all over the place and clearly not meant for publication. And I and they did not include uh they did not include a self-addressed stamped envelope for their 1500 page manuscript. Yeah, what would the and postage so, even be on something like that? <laughs> well, I know and they like you're supposed to do agency. that. This is back when we Yeah, this is back when we actually used paper, do you know? And the job mm -hmm. and the deal was, we'll we'll reveal it, but or we'll review it, but you have to give us something so we can get it back to you. And this person didn't. And so I wrote him a letter uh on on you know, just in the regular mail just saying Hey, this isn't going to work for us. Thank you so much for sending in your 1,500-page manuscript about um, Native American forest firefighters. It actually sounded like a great idea for a book. It just was kind of a mess. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, you didn't send us a um, you know postage to get it back to you. But out of the kindness of my heart, because I feel like such a jerk for rejecting it, we're going to send it back to you. You know, re by regular mail. It's going to take a little while to get there because you know we got to save some money here. Yeah. And the 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 man started writing letters uh, that increased in their level of anger and threat <laughs> as he as he accused me of uh, first of all not accused me of having terrible taste and second of all of having uh, lost his manuscript because he said that he was moving around the country and he would never be able to retrieve the manuscript and this was his only copy. Well, yeah, and it would cost a fortune at Kinko's got, to print that thing out. So we probably right. was. Right. Well, I mean, don't send in your only copy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, it was like um, letter after letter arrived. And now I realize that I had written the letter on behalf of my boss who had never seen it, Susan Ginsburg, my mm -hmm. my boss and mentor. And that was common. You know, you'd you would write, you know, you know, the assistant to Susan Ginsburg. But he was addressing the letters to Susan Ginsburg as though she had personally rejected him. And I'm intercepting these letters that are getting creepier and creepier <laughs> until finally it's a handwritten, angry, sharpie scrawl saying, oh, Ginsburg, I will not I will not forget this indignity. You will hear from me. I will wow. meet you again. And that's when I had to show my boss. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, oh, 
don't worry about it. Just throw it away. <laughs> Finally, I realized that he did get the manuscript back, whether he was lying or about moving around the country or had actually just gotten back to wherever he lived and got the manuscript because <laughs> he, he sent a copy of my of the letter that I had sent with the manuscript back and just said, I hate you or something. Oh, my God. And a year passed. I was there for a while. And a year passed, or maybe two, and I had started representing books on my own at that point. And I noticed my friend Hannah Tinty, uh, who also worked at the literary agency, also was an assistant to an agent, lugging this huge, massive cardboard banker's box full of paper down to her desk going, I don't know what this thing is. And I realized it's the same guy. <laughs> and he had, he had sent it to us again and was just trying someone else. Wow. And I said to I said to Hannah, you know, that's so incredible that you're getting this manuscript from this guy. I told her the whole story. And she's like, yeah, I guess I better send it back. And of wow. course, she ended up getting five or six threatening letters as well. And it just, you know, I don't even blame the guy. You write 1,500 pages. If you believe that the world needs to hear your 1,500 pages, you're probably... You're probably on the bubble of sanity anyway. Yeah, it, it's like a it's like a fruitcake or something, or or it's like a, what is it mm-hmm. on Broadway? Every new show has uh, the dream coat <laughs> that gets passed around from Broadway right. production to Broadway production. <laughs> I don't know what that story is. Tell me what that is. Dream oh, uh, every Broadway show when they open, there's I guess it's like a Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor dream coat where each production. Sure. Uh, sews on a, a new patch to this big, long coat. And every time oh, a show wow. opens on Broadway, it gets passed on from show to show. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Old traditions. But um, yeah. I wonder, when you were a literary agent, were you also performing at that time? I wasn't performing that much, no. I, um, I, thought, that I, I thought that I was going to be a writer of serious short stories about people with feelings. Mm-hmm. And I was a really pretentious person. But I knew that short stories didn't have much of a market. And frankly, I wasn't that much of a not a, I wasn't that much of an egotist that I believed the world needed to hear 1500 pages of my rambling. <laughs> I never was going to write a full novel. And so I knew that my career as a writer was probably going to be fairly limited. So I took a job in publishing so that I could be around writers and take some of their income. <laughs> but pretty okay. soon I realized I was a terrible negotiator and I had started picking up some side gigs writing for magazines. I wrote little reviews of video games for Time Out New York. I started writing little bits and pieces for GQ and then ended up writing a a food column for Men's Journal magazine that allowed me, when the time came for me, to realize that I wasn't going to be a great literary agent. I was going to be a very, very poor literary agent. So I might as well leave that job and instead become a very good, but in a different way, very poor magazine writer. So I started writing for magazine service journalism and profiles of of creative people and i started writing humor for an online and and print journal called mcsweeney's which at the yeah. time was writing or publishing very experimental and absurdist humor online and still are yeah and i understand that it was actually al madrigal your daily show colleague colleague uh, who friend. actually got you into stand-up is that right oh that liar <laughs> <laughs> friend well, no, this came liar. From, I heard this from you, not him. Although he has been on oh, the no. show and he's actually my neighbor here in Pasadena, so I'm just kidding. I love I love Al and, and he's he's not he's he's telling the truth or I was telling the truth when I said that about him. Yeah. So I was writing very esoteric absurd humor from the point of view of a deranged expert, specifically a deranged former professional literary agent. I was writing a column for McSweeney's called Ask a Former Professional Literary Agent, which honed this character that I then went on to perform on The Daily Show as the resident expert. This dry, <laughs> academic, pretentious, New England, Yale-educated creep, which is to say me, giving <laughs> insane advice to people about what kind of beret to wear if they want to be taken as a serious writer, etc. <laughs> I had done some readings on stage in the alternative comedy world of New York before I started on The Daily Show. But it's true that by the time I was on The Daily Show, they the world expected me to have a stand up act. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. And it was not until some years later that Al kind of took me aside. We were on tour together and, and, you know, was telling me about the difference between stand up and what I was doing. And what I was doing was very sort of arch and behind what I would say behind the lines. I was really delivering memorized written material as opposed to leaning forward 
taking control of the audience and being in the moment with the audience, which yeah. I think is the hallmark uh. of stand-up. So it's true that as close as I ever got to doing stand-up, it came because Al really challenged me to get out from behind that character and get into the room and start talking directly to people. Mm -hmm. What was it like being on The Daily Show back in the heyday when Jon Stewart was still hosting? Well, I mean, first of all, it was n entirely implausible for me to be there. So it was amazing. <laughs> I had been a huge fan of the show. And of course, in the early 2000s, we're talking about the, the first Bush administration and into the, and into the second. You know, I was obsessed with politics as much as anyone is now. I loved The Daily Show for its ability to uh, speak the taboo of simply what was actually happening in the world and what the effect the Bush administration was having on on Iraq and on our domestic politics, simply speaking that truth to power. I had no interest in doing it. I wanted to make jokes about, you know, uh, how there were secretly nine U.S. presidents who had hooks for hands, completely un <laughs> unpolitical, weird, out there comedy. But I wrote this book called The Areas of My Expertise, which was mm. this book of fake facts long before fake facts were as popular as they are now. I was I was yeah. doing them. <laughs> and I was writing trivia that was, it was a book of like historical trivia that was made up by me. So it was like the fake history of the U.S. hobo movement in the, in the, in the early 20th century and how the hobos briefly took over the United States government and how the Secretary of the Treasury was Hobo Joe Junkpan and his signature on the dollar <laughs> bill was a picture of a bird. Like just really out there stuff mm. that... That was only vaguely connected to politics. And I went on the show, I went on the Daily Show to promote the book. And John and I had a really good time talking to each other. And then all of a sudden, they asked me to come back as a contributor. And all of a sudden, I was in this terrifying new position of being on my favorite television show. And in the book, you actually recall going to the Emmy Awards just after John Stewart had left the show, but recent enough that he was still nominated. And it's kind of a sad experience in some ways, because I guess the moment that you're off the air, I guess you lose your status at the Emmys. Well, I certainly haven't been invited to the Emmys since. Okay. <laughs> Why would I? I, wasn't, I shouldn't have been there even when I was there with The Daily Show. I was never, you know, I went with The Daily Show to the Emmy Awards in Los Angeles probably six times uh, or maybe uh, maybe fewer, but I was never eligible to win an actual statuette, I would get mm -hmm. a certificate of participation, basically. <laughs> uh, I would get a little red ribbon saying you were there. But as a, as I was not a producer on the show, nor was I ever officially a member of the writing staff, though I did contribute to all of my pieces, uh, I, I couldn't go on stage to get an Emmy if, if we were awarded one as a writing staff. I was just there along for the ride, which in many ways describes what my career on television always felt like to me. I was on... I had infiltrated my favorite television show, and now I had to pretend to, now I had to pretend to like I belonged there. Mm -hmm. And over nine years, I'm glad to say through their, uh, for the through their support of me, through their training of me, through their insistence that I do better, and their uh, uh, and their belief in me, the Daily Show made it such that I did belong there, and that was an incredible experience, surrounded by some of the most incredibly impassioned and smart comedic minds both on camera and off. And so in 2015, uh, when The Daily Show with Jon Stewart received its final nomination for the Emmys, because of course da John had already handed the show over to Trevor Noah, who's doing an incredible job with it, but John and the, and the show with John was still eligible for that early part of the year than they were on. Uh, I went with them. And this time, John said, if we win, I want everyone to get up on stage because this is our last time here. Wow. And sure enough, John won. I mean, not, uh, no one expected him not to. This was his last year as the liberal conscience of television America. And he, the, he was announced or, you know, the show was announced winning for its category. This massive thunderous applause. John encouraged us all to get up on stage. And so we did. And yet for all of the applause, even for John Stewart, by the time all of us filed up on stage, the music had stopped and the applause had stopped and it was just dead silence. And it was really, John put it best. It was like, this is eerie. Like we've been <laughs> off the air for a minute. Really? You're, you're this, we're this far in the past already. You can see what he really said, but that was essentially yeah. what he was saying. It was like, this was, there, there's only so much applause. And when you're yeah. off television, pff, it's done. Yeah. So it, it was a, it was a bittersweet moment, but more bittersweet, sure. obviously, because 
I was saying goodbye to people who had really become family to me. The show had become family in, in all those definitions uh, of really intense, uh, intense closeness, rivalry, support, happiness, anger, sadness, delight, and it was all coming to an end. Now, the title of the book, Medallion Status, is a reference to this very special relationship that you have with your airline loyalty program, uh, and one in particular, <laughs> I don't know if we're saying the name of the airline or not, but in the book you call it Beloved Airlines. What is so special about this airline of choice? <laughs> nothing. Okay. There's nothing. It's Delta. I'll tell you. Okay. I just didn't want to name it in the book because Delta isn't sponsoring the book. I don't want to give them any of my money. <laughs> right. Make but no, I... I I also think it's funny that, like, yes, I do make it out to be a special relationship that I have with this airline and the sick, addictive video game of its loyalty <laughs> reward program, but it's not a special relationship. It feels like a special relationship when you fly enough, or in my case, during the years of 2014 and 2015, being flown back and forth across the country over and over again for a TV job where they were obliged to fly me first class, I unexpectedly achieved so many what they called medallion qualifying miles that one day I was flying back home and the gate agent said to me, oh, thank you for being gold. And I didn't know what they were talking about, but this really spoke to me. I mean, as, a, as, a, as an only child, a super smart, afraid of conflict narcissist from way, way back, I had always thought I was gold. I always <laughs> wanted to be gold. I just didn't know whether anyone could see that I was gold. And all of a sudden, this major corporation is saying, we love you. Thank you for being gold, meaning specifically gold medallion. Yeah. And that's just one of the power-ups that this video game offers you because the more and more you travel, you start to realize you can go on their website and follow a, a, a little health bar showing where you are in their <laughs> status level. So you could be gold and maybe you could get your only this number of miles away from becoming platinum and maybe you're only this number of miles away from becoming diamond medallion. And of course, <laughs> well, yeah. the, the corporation doesn't love you specifically, but there is a kind of sort of sick, uh, a, a, a sick excitement and feeling that briefly you are loved by a big corporation. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like personal validation. <laughs> now, when it comes to the yeah. rankings, is there a difference between diamond and platinum, platinum, gold, gold, silver? Not really. I no. mean, <laughs> you could I, you can go on Delta Airlines uh, website and, and tease out like, yeah, I guess you are you you're going to be considered for a potential upgrade to Delta Comfort Plus, you know, 5 hours earlier if you're platinum compared to gold. <laughs> but really the only upgrades I've ever gotten are like to places that no human wants to go to. Really? Sorry Toledo. <laughs> Actually, I didn't even fly into Toledo. I had to fly into Detroit and drive to Toledo. That's <laughs> that shows you. But anyway, <laughs> I love Detroit, don't get me wrong. What do you have to do to get a plane named after you like in that Clooney movie Up in the Air? Do they have that? <laughs> a lot more. A lot more yeah. than I've done. <laughs> okay. A lot, and, of course, Up in the Air really captures, obviously, what a dubious accomplishment yeah. <laughs> uh, getting getting status with an airline is. I mean, if you're able to say that you flew a million miles, yeah, maybe Sam Elliott will sit down next to you and, you know, touch your forehead <laughs> and whisper to you or something. But truthfully, that's just, you know, someone at a book signing event of mine in, in Boston the other week threw down his United Million Miles member card as though that were a point of pride. And all I could think of was that's just a point of you have left your family, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you have left your family to go travel around the country and the world for a job or whatever it is. I know I was there. That's what made me so sad yeah. when I was flying back and forth across the country, earning my, my gold and then platinum status. I, I knew that when I came home, my child would be sad. And then when I got close to Diamond, I really knew that I had to go and fly and get that diamond. And I knew my son, who was 10 or 11 at the time, would say, are you going away for work again, Dad? And I would have to go, mm, not really. I'm going to go. <laughs> I need to go get an imaginary medallion on the other side of the country. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about this seminal event in your life that led to platinum medallion status. You get a gig on a TV show here in L.A. And during much yeah. of that time, you lived at the Chateau Marmont, which is an easy life to get used to. I know because I used to live in a nice hotel for a couple of years. And it's it's definitely a detachment from reality. It's almost like a throwback to Downton Abbey Day where you have a whole household staff at your disposal. I kind of get what Eloise was talking about, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's funny. El El Eloise, of course, being the children's book about the girl who lives in the Plaza Hotel in New York City, 
which, you know, when I read, I had never read that book as a kid, but when I read it as an adult, I was like, this is the saddest story in the world. This is a girl who's been abandoned by her parents. It's not fun at all. Right. <laughs> and there is, and, and, you know, yes, living in a hotel, especially one like the Chateau, which is so adept to making you feel like you are the, you are n- the most important person in the mm-hmm. world. Um, it, it, it is mind warping and reality warping. I would say to, I would say to people who would come visit me at the Chateau. And I mean, part of the reason that I love the Chateau is not just that they, they treated me nicely. They treated me li- nicely long after they had any reasonable, they had any rational reason to treat me nicely long after my, the peak of my fame had passed and I had just, you know, uh, withered into this sort of ghost of minor fame who was on this small, fun, but small and, and, and little watched cable comedy, they would still treat me very nicely. And I considered that to be an incredible gift, incredible <laughs> gift. And I would bring people to the hotel and I would say, it's not that this is the best place on earth. It's the only place on earth. <laughs> and that's how it would feel to live there. Like, why would you ever leave this place where everyone is so kind to you yeah. simply because they're being paid to? It's it's a it's a castle of lies, but they're they're very pleasant lies <laughs> to live amidst until you have to realize the truth that it's like, yeah. oh yeah, this is not this is not a real life. Yeah. And on one of these trips to LA, you took your family to Disneyland. And I love it because you and your son make this game out of trying to think up the most interesting misdemeanors that might get you thrown in Disney jail. Do you have a favorite yeah. of those? We were taught it was it was funny because well and and sad too because this was during the time when I was working so much in LA and and my family was really hurting. Mm-hmm. Uh you know I, I miss my wife and she missed me but we we've been together for a long time we can hack it but our daughter and son had grown up to the point that you know that those preteen years where they actually started to care whether their dad lived or died. <laughs> like prior to that I was just sort of a cameo a cameo player in the family. But now, you know, my son was like, where are you? And so when I had a break, I flew them out to L.A. and took them all to Disneyland. And we did it up. We, you know, we got a we got a VIP tour guide. My friend Mark McConville, who worked there at the time, got us passes to walk in. And he was telling us about Disney jail. And this is the place where if you act out in Disney, they put you in the cooler. And I was fascinated by Disney jail. What did it look like? Was it themed? Was it in the back of the fake police station on Main Street. Mostly it's just a room, I guess, where people get too drunk or stoned, they go there. And my son turned to me and goes, Dad, have you ever been to Disney jail? And it was an innocent enough question at first. I was like, ha ha, no. And then I was like, wait a minute. What, what do you think is happening when I come out to Los Angeles? Like, right. Do you think, like, what, do you think, first of all, that I'm going to Disneyland all the time without you? Like, by myself, that would be a really sad, yeah. mean betrayal for me to be doing that. And second, do you think I'm going to Disneyland all by myself and just going crazy, <laughs> like getting drunk and high and getting thrown in Disney jail and not telling you? No, I've never been to Disney yeah. jail. But I asked him, what if, what if you wanted to get thrown into Disney jail? What if you had to go into Disney jail? What would be the the best way to go out? And we decided that the you know we went went through a couple of couple of options like standing up in one of the boats in, in Pirates of the Caribbean and pointing at the androids and going, the abomination, <laughs> these violent delights will have violent ends, which is a Westworld re- yeah. reference. My son, my son suggested that he wander through Fantasyland by himself. And if you don't know, the, there there is an animatronic <laughs> yes. version of the, of the evil queen from Snow White yeah. in an upper story window who occasionally parts the curtains and looks out over the crowd. Yeah, and we're my getting into some serious that, Disney Easter eggs here now. Yeah, this is very deep, deep, deep cuts. Yeah. The internet told me that the name of that queen is Grenhilda. I didn't know that. <laughs> so my son said, well, what if I go into Fantasyland and I just stand there by myself crying, going, I... I don't know where my mommy is. I don't know where my mommy is until some nice family comes up and says, can we help you? And then my son would say, I don't know where my mommy is. But then he would wait until Grenhilda, the evil witch, parted the curtains and he would point up at her and goes, there's mommy. (laughs) (laughs) I have brought another family for you, mommy, which was a pretty good joke for my son who was 10 at the time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. He may have a future in comedy. Yeah, I hope so because I need a retirement plan. But I was, I, you know, I said to him, "That's you know, you you crying alone in Fantasyland is more likely 
to attract the attention of Di- Disney social services rather than Disney jail. Yeah. Like you'd probably be taken away from us. <laughs> Finally, I decided that the best way to get the best way to be thrown into Disney jail would be, you know, the Tarzan tree house at Disneyland, mm-hmm. which used to be Swiss family Robinson, which is still a bit of right. a sore point for me. I can tell, I can tell you're as angry about it as I am, <laughs> but it's now Tarzan's tree house. Right. And I was like, what if <clears throat> what if I stood at the top of the circular staircase that leads to Starzen's treehouse wearing nothing but a loincloth and a matted long hair wig <laughs> and say to people as they pass, hi, it's me, Tarzan. You have to give me, there's a little upcharge, you have to give me $20 to get in. <laughs> that that would be a, a pretty accurate description of where my career is at these days. <laughs> Now, one consistent thread throughout the book is exclusive clubs, be they Disney jail or airline loyalty programs, Bilderberg-like New World Order conferences and secret societies in college. You went to Yale, which has a few pretty well-known secret societies, chief among them being, I guess, Skull and Bones. Were you ever in a secret society in college? Well, for those of you who don't know, Yale is a four-year accredited college in Southern (laughs) Connecticut that I attended to for all four years. I got a Bachelor of Arts in literary theory. And no, no, I was not invited to be a member of any of the senior secret societies. Well, But isn't that what a member would say? No, if I were a member of Skull and Bones, then the moment you said Skull and Bones, I would have been obligated to leave this podcast booth. Okay. You're supposed to leave the room, or <laughs> is so is the, the legend. I don't know. <laughs> I've been fascinated with secret rooms since I was but a child. And I would always read in throughout middle school and high school about, you know, the secret Club 33, the secret restaurant mm-hmm. at Disneyland right. and the secrets of the Freemasons. And, of course, the secret societies at Yale, these senior secret clubs like Skull and Bones, Book and Snake, uh, Scroll and Key, Brazellus, Wolf's Head. Those are the big ones, Manuscript, that occupy these old and stately clubhouses on campus in Yale. That, and it, and these buildings that have no windows, they're called tombs. And the secret societies were formed by upper crust, aristocratic young men way back, way back in the day at Yale. And they would have their family architect build them this massive stately clubhouse that looked like a public library or a, a, a marble mausoleum, but it would have no windows. Yeah. And it was this amazing this amazingly disturbing mix of um, sort of incredible money uh, being poured into what is ultimately just uh, what's the, what's the age level of this podcast? Uh, in thirties, all all Late ages, thirties. Do people curse on the podcast? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. This podcast is not geared toward high schoolers. <laughs> it's fine. So it was all, it was always sort of absurd and comic and fascinating for me to see, especially, you know, once I started attending Yale, these massive, beautiful buildings without windows that were dedicated essentially to be a young man masturbation club. I mean, it was just nothing. It was just the dumb... <laughs> They didn't have frats when they created these secret societies. So men men didn't have structures with which they could hang out together and and tell each other secrets and masturbate into a coffin. They had to make it up. And that's what they made up, these secret societies. <laughs> so strange. Now some of them are less secret than others. Some of them are right. co-educational and have been for years. I I I always was fascinated. It may have been the reason that I applied to Yale. Oh, yeah. And so when I was invited to a party at Book and Snake, one of the more open co-ed progressive secret societies, but nonetheless, one that occupies this giant windowless tomb right near the right near the Beinecke Rare Books Library. Wow. As a freshman, I was invited to this party and I was really excited. I got so excited. I went to the party, I got drunk, and I fell down the stairs. And then I woke up in the hospital. And the last memory I had was walking up to the door of the secret society. I knew I had gone in there. I knew I had been at the party. I knew I had gotten excited and got drunk and fell down the stairs. All of this was relayed to me. But the mystery of what happened when I was in there was taken from my brain because secret societies know how to protect their secrets. <laughs> Only years later, as I recount in the book, after telling this story on stage and off for years about having my brain erased by the Book and Snake Secret Society, did current senior members of Book and Snake invite me back for a party inside this windowless room 
<laughs> and I had to go back. I needed to see what my eyes had seen that I had forgotten. <laughs> And of course, I tell the story in the book, and it's a, it's a, I won't tell you more. Yeah, you really seem to have a fascination with these secret groups. And at one point, I think you were touring with the Boston Pops, and you and a buddy of yours tried to infiltrate the Church of Scientology's Flagland base in Clearwater, Florida. What was that like? That's oh, in be a Clearwater. Place. Yeah, in Clearwater, Florida. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't want to. No, <laughs> I was traveling in Florida with my friend and writing partner David Reese. And uh, we were traveling through Florida because I was on tour there, and David had uh, agreed to come and keep me company. And we were passing through Clearwater, and David's like, I want to go check out the Flag Land Base, which is one of the major headquarters of the Church of Scientology. Uh, there's Flag Land Base. There's Gold Base, which is in Hammett, California, which is their administrative offices. There's Pacific Base in uh, in Los Angeles, which is also called Big Blue. Uh, which is their big Los Angeles headquarters right near the Celebrity Center. And then, of course, there's flat, and there's the Free Winds, which is their cruise ship, where they give out the highest level of Scientology training, operating, th- operating Thetan Level 8. And then there's Flagland Base. And at this point, David Reese was like, oh, you sure know a lot about this stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> I read Glowing Clear by Lawrence Wright. I'm fascinated by this stuff, but I don't want to get anywhere near this place because I'm scared of them. I'm scared of them because... 15 or more years ago, when I was writing for GQ, I made the dumbest, most juvenile joke about Scientology. It was not signed. It was in this front of the book calendar that had no no indication that I had written it. And three months later, when the when the issue hit the stands and this, this dumb, juvenile, completely harmless joke got out there, the Church of Scientology started writing me letters, many of them, telling them I was a religious bigot who could only be helped by joining Scientology. They had gotten my email from my editor because they had bullied him into giving my email away. And I knew that the whole point of that letter writing campaign was to remind me, to let me know they were watching. And I did not. I felt really nervous now, 15 to well, maybe 20 years later, sneaking around the flag land base, this place that I had only heard of and had never been close to. And yet David Reese kind of like egged me on. He said, let's just walk around it. And I'm like, I think they're going to surveil us. He's like, you're crazy. And we made this one walk around the the main block of the new building that they built recently, the new addition to the flag land base, which is also known as the superpower building for reasons that are too long to explain here. And as we walked around the entirely deserted downtown of Clearwater, Florida, observing all of the different cameras as they're hidden in the corners of this building, all of which the windows, unlike Book and Snake and the Secret Societies, Scientology buildings have windows, but they're they're tinted black, so you can't see in. And when we finally circled around to the front, where there had been no people, all of a sudden there were like six or seven Sea Org members. Those are the that's Scientology's highest level of clergy right. wearing their little vests just staring dead straight ahead as we passed them. Were they there for us? Later, I would learn through observation that they were actually there to meet a group of, a bus full of Scientologists coming back from an off-site event or whatever. But it was profoundly unnerving to walk by these, you know, half a dozen people whose job was to let us know we were there, but to not speak to us. (laughs) And then as we finally turned the last corner, we saw a guy taking a picture of our car in our license plate. And also David was like, let's get out of here as quickly as possible. Yeah. This is the creepiest thing I've ever seen. Oh my God. This Later, is a Halloween story. <laughs> I know. It was really it was really spooky. It was really spooky. And I was like, I don't want them to be mad at me again. I don't want to get letters anymore. Let's go. And I think you say in here that it's actually easier to infiltrate Mar-a-Lago when the president is in town than it is to get into the Flagland base. The truth is, and you know, the stories in the book, uh, we didn't make it all the way in, though now we've learned it's pretty easy to do so. But we got a lot closer to Mar-a-Lago than we got to the land base of Scientology. Okay. And the, clearly the Scientologists have better better security than the Winter White House. That's wow. what I'm saying. Was this before or after that Chinese spy got into Mar-a-Lago with a, with a thumb drive? It was before. And okay. that was the thing that David said to me as we were driving there. You know, after the, after the spookiness of uh, Clearwater and Scientology sort of uh, dissipated, David said, let's try to get into Mar-a-Lago now. I'm like, no, I don't want to. I don't, I'm a, I don't want to be thrown in jail. Yeah. And he said, yeah, is there I bet a Mar-a-Lago it's easy. Jail, said, like Disney jail? 
Yeah, I think Mar-a-Lago jail is probably a little bit more real. Yeah. <laughs> you would think, or so I thought, right? David said, I bet you you could just walk in there if you were dressed as a dumb billionaire or a servant. <laughs> and now yeah, we know it's true. The deranged millionaire. <laughs> yeah, I probably could have walked in if I had worn... If I had worn my old deranged millionaire outfit from The Daily Show, if I had worn my <laughs> tuxedo with my ascot and walked around in bare feet, yeah. they would have just let me walk on through. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I get in my own way sometimes. Well, before we go, I also want to mention your podcast. You are the host of the Judge John Hodgman podcast, where you mediate minor disputes between two individuals. Oftentimes it's couples, and most of these disputes are sort of tongue-in-cheek, the kind of things between a couple that maybe make for a fun anecdote when you're having dinner with friends. But sometimes these things that we tease each other about can also reveal real resentments and all kinds of passive aggression. Have you ever had a case where it just suddenly went very dark and acrimonious? No, not acrimonious because, you know, we we speak to the people beforehand and we know that they're going to be good sports. Mm Mm-hmm. There are times, though, when it's clearly much more serious than we anticipated. I will, I will, I will slightly correct you. The, 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 the disputes that we hear, while often very minor, like my husband has a very specific way that he wants me to load the dishwasher that's annoying, or my husband has a very specific way of taking out the garbage that he wants me to, to follow, which is very annoying. Husbands have a lot of very specific right. theories about how <laughs> things should be done, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there, there are the, the, while the, while the topics might be small, they and we always take it as seriously as it is. Some of the topics are a little bit more fanciful, like yeah. is a machine gun a robot or something. <laughs> but you know, like we we you know there there's a woman who wrote in and she's like my husband uses the the smart thermostat to turn off the air conditioning at night when when he's a, when he's abroad, like so he'll go away <laughs> and I'll. I'll do the air conditioning to what I want it to be. And somewhere in Scandinavia where he's out, you know, out of the country for business, he'll look at and decide she doesn't need that temperature. I'm going to change it. Oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, no, you can't do that, dude. That's wrong. You can't, con- you can't, con- you know, like smart technology does not allow you to monitor yeah. and control your spouse's temperature. <laughs> do you have your own version of Judge Judaism's? Well, let's see. Uh, we have some, you know, we have some pieces of settled law oh, yeah. which come up quite a bit, which are, <laughs> which are, which are not yelly things. They're mostly like people like what they like. That means you can't, you can't force someone to watch Game of Thrones, even though I know my wife would really like it. <laughs> you have to be be mindful of the work that you leave for others, which is to say, you know, you should, you should not leave your hotel room as a, a total wreck. Just because you know someone's coming in to clean it up, that's why you should try to be a little bit more right. decent about it and also always leave a tip. And then, of course, um, uh, 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 specificity is the soul of narrative. Uh, give examples when you're telling a story rather than just tell a story. And then mm. there was another one, too. Oh, yeah, a hot dog is not a sandwich. Let's not fight about it. <laughs> probably, probably, the most Judge Judy, probably the most Judge Judy-ish of sayings in the courtroom, though, has been long contributed by my bailiff and co-host and co-creator, Mr. Jesse Thorne who will tell litigants when they get out of order, shut your pie hole. <laughs> okay. Well, again, the podcast is called Judge John Hodman, Judge John Hodgman Podcast. I know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I, it's my, my name is hard to say, and then I added a hard thing to say. It's Judge John Hodgman. Judge John Hodgman. Yeah, the double J's and the G in the middle of Hodgman really the get you. Is, I know, it's like Pete Buttigieg. Yeah. Like, what if it were J- Judge John Buttigieg? It's almost that bad. <laughs> so don't forget to tune in to the Judge John Hodgman podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And again, the book is called Medallion Status, True Stories from Secret Rooms. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'm on tour right now with the book and Judge right. John Hodgman Live. So if you'll forgive me. I'm just going to tell people, check out johnhodgman.com slash tour. Absolutely. Go check it out, folks. John, thanks. It was fun. The pleasure was mine. It was fun. I agree with you. Thank you. Thanks again to John Hodgman for coming on the podcast. Once more, you can order his new book, Medallion Status, True Stories from Secret Rooms on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books are sold. Be sure to subscribe to the Judge John Hodgman podcast and keep up with John at johnhodgman.com or on Twitter at at Hodgman. 
If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and rate and review us while you're there. Five-star ratings and detailed reviews are one of the best ways for new listeners to discover the show. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at at KickAssNewsPod and recommend us to your friends on your social media. For more fun stuff, visit KickAssNews.com and I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at KickAssNews.com. For now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kickass News.